I'm deaf. I'm Paul Barry deaf. My parents didn't know I was deaf until I was 18 months old. My parents' world fell apart, primarily because of the Hearing Society's view on deafness as a negative. My doctor, ear, nose, and throat specialist, told my parents that I should not learn sign language because it would make me isolated from the hearing community. I had to learn to speak and to read lips to fit in with hearing culture. So I did. I grew up learning to speak and read lips, trying to fit in with hearing society. And man, it was a challenge, frustrating. Communication was not always there with 100% access. When I was three years old, I spoke my first word, boat. My parents were driving, and out the window, I saw a boat and kept repeating the word. That's, I guess, why I have a 29-foot cruiser today. <laughs> My parents, upon looking back, realized that the doctors didn't really understand the critical part of, of language development for infants. It's so critical that deaf babies have a first language, American Sign Language. It's natural, visual language for them to develop as a basis, and then they can learn to speak and read lips later in life. And that's the most important part for deaf babies, to have that critical access, that first language. Today I'm 53 years old. I'm proud to be deaf. American Sign Language is something that I greatly value because it flung the world wide open for me, even more than I had before. I love American Sign Language, deaf culture, and deaf history, and the deaf community. We know we're not disabled. We just have a language, a different language. We know who we are. We can do everything just as you can. We have successful deaf attorneys, deaf doctors, scientists, engineers, college professors, athletes, actors. We even have a deaf receptionist in the White House. When I talk about culture, what do I mean that I love deaf culture? We have a culture just like any other group, Hispanic, Asian, black. They value their language and their own culture, such as we value our own deaf culture and our own language. So let me give you some examples of normative deaf culture. We can be really blunt. <laughs> I mean, if you come up to, to someone deaf and they say, you've gained weight, wow, you've gotten fat, what's wrong? <laughs> hearing people will not say that. Oh, you look good. If that's a bad haircut, you know, we'll tell you. Those clothes aren't right for you. <laughs> hearing people are so nice, culturally. <laughs> oh, you look good, is all they'll say. It's nice to get that honesty. We typically are very detail-oriented. If someone passes away, we'll ask questions. What's wrong? What happened? How'd they die? And ask for a lot of details. But in hearing culture, they'll say, oh, I'm sorry they passed. If a hearing student comes into my classroom, they'll say, I'm so sorry I was late, and sit down. But if a deaf student comes into my classroom, they'll say, oh, sorry I was late. You've got to know why, because there was a truck on the highway, and it was full of egg crates, and it fell over, and the police and all the ambulances came in, and they blocked the road. I couldn't get through it on and on for two or three minutes, and then end with, sorry I'm late. <laughs> That's part of our culture. We value that information sharing. 
let me, get, let me tell you about, we have a five-stage goodbye. If hearing friends come over to my house for a party, oh, they'll stay about an hour, hour and a half, and they'll leave. Bye. Oh, OK. But if my deaf friends come over, they will stay forever. I mean, forever, even if I'm urging them to leave. So if we're in a restaurant together, we'll be talking, and the manager will come up to the table and indicate we're closing in about five minutes. OK, but we don't leave. We're still talking for another 10 to 15 minutes. And we realize it, and then we get away from the table, step a little further away, but we're still talking for 10 or 15 more minutes, sharing information. And then we're standing by the door in a group, and we're talking, and the manager angrily shutting the lights off and motioning us to leave. That's the third stage. And then we're out in the parking lot, and that's, we're out to our fourth stage of goodbye, and in our cars, still talking. We're still catching up, and finally we leave. That's the reason we really depend on each other to share information. For hearing culture, you typically can hear the radio or talk amongst yourselves to get news and information, whereas we rely on sign language for our information between ourselves, and that's how we communicate. And that's the most important part of our culture. When we talk about sign language, sign language is nothing new. It's been here for thousands of years. When we have to fight almost daily to protect sign language, we experience a lot of oppression, discrimination, just as any other cultural group ex experiences oppression on their cultures, discrimination on their languages. We are the same. Now, looking back historically, in 427 BC, the Greek philosopher Plato, in his essay, Cratylus, the character of Socrates is quoted, if we do not have voice or tongue, but we wish to communicate our feelings and thoughts, what should we do? Such as those deaf people who use gestures, body language, facial expression, and movement to express their thoughts. And that's the earliest documented use of American Sign Language. It's been here ever since. So here in America, in the 1700s, Martha's Vineyard, the island, there had the largest deaf population, generational deafness. Every one out of 25 individuals was hereditarily deaf. And everyone on that island signed and spoke. Everyone, hearing and deaf, knew sign language. It was one cohesive community that understood each other. The community events, meetings, everything was conducted in sign language. No barriers. Deaf people were fully included and successful. Now, later on, in 1817, the American School for the Deaf, America's first deaf education, was established in Hartford, Connecticut. That's when many Martha's Vineyard residents from the island moved to, to that school. And graduates from the American School went on to other states to found deaf schools there, all over the US. And that was the most glorious moment, well-educated deaf community college-educated, establishing Gallaudet University, the world's only liberal arts university for the deaf, founded in 1864, which provided a college degree for deaf individuals. Many deaf graduates from the American School for the Deaf went to Gallaudet University, and it was the best time for us. We had access to education. We were successful business owners. We conducted business and our lives on equal footing. And 66 years later, in 1880, that was the year we will never forget. It's indelibly etched on our minds within the deaf community. The world delegates convened in Milan, Italy, for the Second International Congress on deaf education. 
There, the delegates voted to forbid sign language and mandated that deaf children learn to speak and read lips, just as hearing society does. And that's what vastly changed the deaf world. The result and the impact in America was that they fired all deaf teachers. Most of them couldn't speak. Replaced all of them with hearing teachers who taught deaf children how to read lips and speak. The impact was felt worldwide. And that was the darkest, most oppressive era of the deaf world. Job opportunities vastly declined. The world's hearing and deaf were rent apart. Our world using sign language, hearing world using spoken English. And it was the darkest time we've ever been through. Finally, in 1960, at Gallaudet University, an English professor, Dr. William Stokey, he recognized that deaf students on campus were signing very fluently and similarly and recruited two deaf researchers to work with him. They researched American Sign Language and finally proved definitively that American Sign Language is its own language, its own grammar, syntax, morphology, mouth movements, hand shape, locations, and the five parameters of sign were identified. Spatial movement, facial expression, and that was not a form of English after all. It was a completely different and separate language with, the, with its own rules. People had assumed that sign language was based on English, but it was not. That finally brought our deaf community back to where it should have been all along. The, the use of ASL flourished. And at that time, many children who had deaf parents, they had been born into that deaf world, had American Sign Language as their first language, and had grown up in the deaf community. Those individuals took on the responsibility as our first interpreters because of our worlds being so separate and became interpreters communicating between both the hearing and deaf worlds. But we didn't have enough. We needed more interpreters. With, it was the baby boomers time and we needed more interpreters. So finally, in the 1970s, College programs were established nationwide, all over the U.S., to train interpreters. And many students who were hearing with no prior knowledge of sign language entered into those interpreter training programs. But we realized that you can't learn the cultural nuances and the language in two or four years because of the deep roots of our language and the cultural implications. The interpreters themselves experience challenges learning to interpret between deaf and hearing cultures. And then over the years, as interpreting field has grown, now you'll be seeing a new movement. Deaf interpreters taking on the responsibility to be, to be interpreters. American Sign Language is their first language. A full understanding of language and culture intrinsically. They take signed language, interpret it to a hearing interpreter who will then translate it to spoken English and back and forth. A team of interpreters, deaf and hearing. So if you look back, to the year 1880 and to now, deaf interpreters, we're seeing more of them. We'll see them interpreting in, in legal settings, in medical and hospital settings, working for a more complete interpretation between our two separate worlds, interpreting back and forth. But that year, that year of 1880, if those delegates had never voted to forbid sign language, 
remember the golden era of the deaf community, the deaf teachers, the children with full access to language, with everyone on one level playing field. If 1880 had never happened and rent our worlds apart, suppose that had never occurred, that that vote had never happened. Would that mean that you would be signing today along with us? Signing fluidly, we would be one world. We wouldn't need interpreters. We could go back to those days of Martha's Vineyard and have that experience from then until now. It's a nice idea that we would be one world with no barriers. Back to our golden age of successful deaf individuals, well-educated. It's something to think about. Thank you.